The following is an Operation Podcast production. The way I think about it is like, it's helpful to know where the highest impact is. Like if I'm going to 80-20 this, like seeing your blood work before you have a problem, right? Because you'll see issues in your blood work long before you have any symptoms that allows you to focus your energy on that issue versus something else. So, you know, like if you look at like the classic health advice, there's so much of it. And it's all correct for somebody, you know, or a lot of it is true for someone who has that, like that specific issue, but it's, it's hard, you know, following all of it can be really difficult. So it's like, is it really that I need to sleep more, or exercise more? Do I need to cut carbs or whatever? Like these types of things. Do I need to focus on my lipids? Like it, it, there's a range of things or it's, it could be hormonal, right? And it's a range of things that could eventually cause very serious symptoms and illness, but it's, uh, it's hard to, um, just purely by following all the best practices, like in theory, you don't need to check, but in practice, probably you're not going to be able to do everything. Right. So it allows you to, to like apply like an 80, 20 rule. It's like, which, which mm-hmm. preventative things are going to really matter for you specifically, because you might need to see that like improvement or those problems to, to like, want to, to want to do all that. My name is Michael Dubrovsky. I'm the chief product officer and co-founder of SciFox Health. And this is Everforward Radio. What we're going to talk about today is hopefully going to be a reminder for some people, but an eye-opener for a lot of others. We are facing, have been facing, I think, a whole new level of pandemic in terms of chronic illness, disease, information, misinformation. And what we're going to get into here is meant to really deliver a lot of what is working in the healthcare industry what is not working and how, in my opinion, we as the consumer and as someone who is just very interested and cares about our health, our wellness, lifespan, health span, can take that power back. And in my opinion, power starts first with information and education and then application. Uh, what we're really going to be talking about is you, your labs, your blood, and I found this really interesting article from Forbes and everything we talk about here on the show always is going to be listed down in the show notes for everybody. So you can check out the references. This Forbes article is actually talking about the decline of lab techs and the response by the industry is actually to not get your labs or push them off even longer because they can't handle the load. Um, Just off the cuff, man, to hear something like that, how does that land on you? Yeah, so that's not a that's an interesting article. I I wasn't familiar with it before, you know, before we uh, talked about it briefly before the show started. And uh, I think it's um, you know, the it's just a healthcare industry is this is it's very um, it's its own world. Um, it's kind of like a you know maybe there's like capitalism, socialism, communism, and healthcare industry. You know, it's like its own universe of of like upside down economics and and so on, uh, and. I think it's sometimes they try to balance a lot of things that it's not like, okay, what is the best thing for the end user? They're balancing a lot of things against each other. And uh, as an individual, maybe it makes sense, like from a system perspective, but as an individual, it can, it can like be super obvious. It doesn't make sense. Right. So uh, if I, if I am actually want to get the best healthcare, I probably should get the labs that, that I need to get versus, you know, whatever the, like the system is having trouble providing them, right? Or so they suggest, like maybe you don't need these, right? Um, so that, but that that's kind of, I think, um, I think there's a lot of countercurrents to that, right? So you see those kinds of things happening in like traditional healthcare, and then there's so many other things springing up, like in parallel. Uh, so um, I, I think it's probably more positive than negative if you sum it up, uh, you know, across everything that's going on. Uh, but it's sad to hear that, honestly. Yeah. And again, I'm going to link this article for everybody to check out and I encourage you to please do so. But in response to this, we're hearing from governing bodies, authorities, even the organizations themselves. This is their response to, hey, we are significantly understaffed and we're not having as many people trained as we need to become certified lab techs. And this is a direct quote. They're saying, don't order baseline laboratory studies, which are complete blood count coagulation testing or serum biochemistry for asymptomatic patients undergoing low risk, non-cardiac, non-cardiac surgery. Now I understand that's kind of specific, but I interpret that as going basically don't run labs if you're not symptomatic. And in my opinion, that, that kind of goes against 
what I believe, because you're going to find yourself probably needing deeper, more involved healthcare only once you have a problem. But running baseline labs, getting simple diagnostic labs, hell, even just going, getting your annual physical and what your doctor typically provides in that experience, you can learn a lot of information that can prevent anything from ever happening in many cases, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that in you can see like in other industries, there's a big effort to increase the amount of data that you collect because there's so much that can be done with it. Um, and, and I think it's, I mean, I don't know about this very specific case, but, but like, it seems, seems obvious that, uh, we want more data than less. Um, and, and ideally, you know, the, the data that like is based on the latest research and so on. So like, we want a lot, like a lot of, um, like something dynamic rather than like, okay, let's try to pare back, uh, you know, and actually have less data than we used to. They go on to say, um, this is part of uh, choosing wisely this effort up in Canada, it looks like. Their suggestions include don't do annual screening blood tests unless directly indicated by the risk profile. Again, I very strongly disagree personally. And then if you do enough tests, something will come back abnormal and lead to needless further investigation. Quote, abnormal results are found in at least 5% of people, though it may be their norm particularly vitamin D. And it's interesting they're highlighting vitamin D and they're saying don't routinely measure vitamin D in low-risk adults. Instead, just give them vitamin D supplements. So now we're saying don't even get a test, just start supplementing, which I take supplements, I'm a believer in them, but only after knowing my body and knowing what I'm getting or not getting in my nutrition and especially after looking at my labs to see what I can get rid of, what I need to maintain, or what I should supplement with. Do you agree with this as well? Yeah, I think from, from our, I mean, it's interesting, you know, like I think vitamin D is pretty low risk, but from our data, we do get people that are too high in vitamin D. And probably what it what it is exactly this kind of thing where they're over supplementing, but they're not measuring. Um, and, and that that might be negative as well, right? So I think it's, it's a, uh, Again, it's just a matter of trying to create a like convenience and abundance versus limitation and like austerity, you know. So it's it's okay if we can measure these things and do and do it. Like basically, you know, would Jeff Bezos just take a vitamin D supplement without having his vitamin D measured? Like, no, right? And so it's the same thing. You know, he he uses the same iPhone that I use, right? So like, why can't I have the same blood test that he gets? Like, it's it feels like uh, we should aim for a society where it's it's more flat, you know, in terms of, in terms of the kind of healthcare that that everybody gets. Uh, so I think from that perspective, it like kind of it's like a clarifying thought. Like, okay, what would you do if cost was no object? This other article from Lab Me, and this is from um, Dr. Anthony Close on their staff there back in 2021, talking about some shocking healthcare stats in the USA. And this statement hit me so hard. Quote: Well, in the case of healthcare, one hundred dollars now could save you from $900,000 in the future or worse. How would you kind of break this down for the person listening right now? Thinking about investing out of pocket or in contribution to your HSA, FSA, or something like that, about $100 to get some labs in terms of prevention of potentially not only chronic illness and disease down the road, but hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars later in terms of what that unchecked marker could cost you heart attack, stroke, things like that. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, the greatest problem for American, the healthcare system, the American healthcare system is this issue of like people getting chronic diseases, which are extremely costly, not just, you know, it's not just money, right? Like it's uh once you, you lose your health, it's kind of money is secondary. Uh, but it's, um, a lot of them are preventable, uh, and you see that just because, for example, in Europe, only three out of ten people have a chronic disease, but in America, six out of ten do. So it's uh, it's like, and it's the same, you know, genetically, it's like a very similar population. So it's uh, they're definitely preventable, and you know, a lot of it is lifestyle. Maybe some of it is like exposures and other things, but basically, knowing it's very difficult to. Like, you know, some people live like a perfect lifestyle, but that's not realistic for most people. So I think knowing where you might be trending in the wrong direction helps you focus like, okay, I'm, I have this much energy every day to like try to 
live correctly. Uh, and I think for me, this is like that because I'm not like a, you know, triathlete or whatever, you know, who's like eating perfectly. So like in my case, I, you know, I'm an engineer, I work on blood testing, but the way I think about it is like, it's helpful to know where the highest impact is. Like if I'm going to 80, 20, this, like seeing your blood work before you have a problem, right? Because you, you'll see issues in your blood work long before you have any symptoms that allows you to focus your energy on that issue versus something else. So, you know, like if you look at like the classic health advice, there's so much of it. And it's all correct for somebody, you know, or a lot of it is true for someone who has that, like that specific issue, but it's, it's hard, you know, following all of it can be really difficult. So it's like, is it really that I need to sleep more or exercise more? Do I need to cut carbs or whatever? Like these types of things, do I need to focus on my lipids? Like it, it, there's a range of things or it's, it could be hormonal, right? And it's a range of things that could eventually cause very serious symptoms and illness, but it's, uh, it's hard to, um, just purely by following all the best practices, like in theory, you don't need to check, but in practice, probably you're not going to be able to do everything. Right. So it allows you to, to like apply like an 80, 20 rule. It's like, which, which preventative things are going to really matter for you specifically. And to kind of get to the end here on my portion of, you know, my goal is to educate people. Hopefully I'm not scaring you too much, but when it comes to life or death, um, I think maybe a little bit, <laughs> a little bit of getting scared about uh, your health is a good thing. Chronic illness and disease, the number one killer, and it has been for many, many years of people in the U S <clears throat> excuse me, has been heart disease, cardiovascular disease. Um, in fact, pulling from this article from U.S. News recently, the top 10 causes of death in the U.S., the number of deaths reported was um, in 2022, 702,880. And that is about 167.2 per 100,000 population. That's not that crazy of a stat. There's odds are, so for you listening, you know, look around your office, look around the gym, either them or somebody they know has unfortunately been on the receiving end of cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke. And um, it's preventable. It's flat out preventable. Some cases, some small amount of these cases are in fact linked, you know, genetically, but even that's information. So if you know you're genetically predispos predisposed, you can do things to really most likely prevent it or really reduce the detrimental effect it can have should you suffer a heart attack or stroke. Um, and this Next stat is coming from the World Health Federation, excuse me, the World Heart Federation. And they're saying that an estimated 80% of cardiovascular disease, including heart disease and stroke, is preventable. The main elements of CVD prevention are healthy diet, physical activity, avoiding tobacco, and, quote, knowing your numbers. And these numbers we're talking about are your labs, looking at biomarkers such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, or even diabetes. So how does it land on you, Michael, to know that the number one killer of Americans, um, maybe even across the world, but this stat I believe is just in the US, is preventable and preventable by just something as simple as getting your blood drawn? Yeah, so I think uh, we think about this a lot and we focus on heart health. And that's like a big part of the blood testing that we do is and we, we've do try to do like as comprehensive as possible, but uh, a, a large chunk of the markers is heart health related. Um, and because it's so important, but I, I think the, what's becoming more popular is to look at more markers because typically it's, it's like HDL, LDL, the lipids that um, your standard physical is going to look at, but that, that doesn't capture the whole, the whole story. And you really have to look at the proteins that carry the lipids. So like APOB, APOA, uh which have been known already for maybe 20 years it's like very agreed upon uh in kind of in the medical and research community that those are more predictive of heart attacks uh, and cardiovascular events than ldl hdl uh but but it's just like there's a lot of inertia because the ldl hdl tests are older they've been used longer and so on but i, I think that's kind of that's shifting there was actually a wall street journal article yesterday about apob which was very surprising like it's getting really mainstream. what did it say uh, t test your APOB basically. <laughs> <laughs> all so, right. All right. But it's like, that's surprising, you know, like I, I didn't know it was like getting, getting so mainstream, but it, it has been, you know, if you're, if you're going to like concierge medicine or whatever, it's standard, but it, it hasn't been mainstream, uh, or, or it, it hasn't quite yet gotten mainstream, but I, I think in within, you know, 10 years, probably it'll be much more widespread. Um, but it's already something that, you know, if you're going to SciFox or another like specialty labs, uh, company, they're going to be testing that. 
Um, and I think optimizing for ApoB increases your chances of actually, you know, uh, like like it's LDL works, but but it works at a population level. But as an individual, you want you want the thing that's like as accurate as possible. Again, so uh, and we see a lot of people like we actually have. There's one guy that wrote a whole thing about it. Uh, it you know, after this happened to him, so he he was a uh, like ran half marathons. He was maybe 40 years old, very like healthy looking guy. Takes the Cyfox test. And he has normal LDL, uh, so that's why he's never had any like that didn't know anything. But his ApoB was very high, uh, and so he went and got a CAC scans, and it turned out like he was very close to having a heart attack. Like his arteries were blocked. He had to get several stents. Like very, very serious. With running around, literally running around with quote normal yeah. cholesterol. Yeah, yeah, he was a runner with normal cholesterol, and and you know like because he was a runner, I think he was a pretty high risk of like having a heart attack while running, right? And and that happens sometimes, and and so basically he um yeah he got the stents and and he's back to running, and and so he's just like super. And, and this was again, this is the hundred dollars versus nine hundred thousand dollars. Like, what is it worth to you to not have a heart attack, right? Like, it's much better to get the test. So I think from that perspective, um, it's. It, you know, if, even if even if you were just doing the math on like what the healthcare cost to the world is, it, not even on the individual level, I think it makes a lot of sense to do way more screening. So it's like the opposite. You know, instead of having less labs, it's more labs. But I think just the way that um, the way that incentives work, you know, people don't stay on the same health plan very long time. So it's like mm -hmm. worrying about what's going to happen to you in thirty years doesn't really make sense for that health plan. So there's like there's reasons why there's not more screening, but I think it's a uh, it's something that we're like the world is evolving towards for sure. And, and, you know, we try to make it as easy as possible for people to do. And, uh, and that's to me feels like the obvious direction, you know? Um, and it's true for many, you know, like heart disease is, is one thing, but basically again, like six out of 10 Americans have a chronic disease. So it's, it's just, uh, it was just a crazy stat. Right. Um, so if you're in the other four out of 10, you know, you want to stay out of this. You don't want to graduate to that group. Right. So it's, it's, exactly, uh, exactly. I think, I think it's, and you, it's also, some of them are reversible, right? So like it's reversible or like very manageable in some cases. And again, a lot of it, it will come down to monitoring the markers and then adjusting lifestyle and other things to, to, you know, to improve them. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's definitely, um, I think an important problem that, Luckily, you know, America is like a wealthy and happy place in general. And I know it does, people don't think that way, but it's uh, my family's from the Soviet Union. And so it's uh, I think here things are pretty, pretty good. Uh, and so that kind of leaves the luxury of like, uh, you know, thinking about like, OK, what's my longevity going to be like? How can I stay healthy like past 40 and all these things? And I I think that's great. Right. Because uh, it, in many cases, like people don't have the luxury to even think about it. Right. So I, I think I'm it's exciting for me that, you know, I I'm in my early 30s and I'm thinking like, OK, how do I keep this party going for, you know, for a long time rather than kind of like turn into a 40 year old guy that's like slowly uh, becoming immobile and, and these kinds of things, which is which is maybe more more like how life used to be for some people. Nazdorovia, right? Nazdorovia. Yeah, yeah. 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 To your health. To all my non ruski friends out there. Yeah. Um, Another thing that came up for me when understanding what Cyfox is doing and just this, this model really of delivering at home, trustworthy, reliable, quick um, labs is access to care. And in my opinion, you know, someone coming from working in concierge medicine as a clinical health coach for many years, access to care was paramount. And in that model, it was a little different because like I said, it was concierge medicine. These are already typically affluent people or people who can afford. I believe back then it was about $200 a month or so uh, for access to care, more direct access to your doctor, faster labs, kind of more white glove service. I don't know what things are nowadays, but let's talk about the people maybe who don't even have health insurance. People who are so far away from, I don't even know when my last lab was because it's what is the job what are the benefits? Do I get health insurance? Am I paying for this out of pocket? And when you're paying for things out of pocket, every dollar matters. And it becomes a difficult decision for a lot of people to go, am I going to be investing in rent? Am I going to be investing in food? Or am I going to be investing into health insurance, HSA, FSA, investing into my health by organic fruits and vegetables? Or am I going to spend a couple hundred dollars or a hundred dollars to get some labs that according to a lot of the things on the internet, 
I don't need, or some entities are even saying, don't get unless you're symptomatic. What would you say to that person that is going, I've got this hundred dollars and convince me to invest it into my health through information, through diagnostic labs? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think, um, you know, the starting point, probably I, I have to agree with like, you know, people generally say this and it's probably true is that, you know, you exercise and sleep are probably the first step. So like if you are not getting and free, free. Sleep, yeah, and they're they're almost free. Like, you know, there's it, maybe it's like the, the gym membership or buying like, uh, you know, free weights or whatever, but I, whatever it takes to get to get those basic things, I think that's that those are probably on the whole more important than labs especially regular labs, but I think getting your labs done once at least makes a lot of sense because again, there's this risk of, you know, once you have the, if, if you catch problem early, it's going to cost you much less in the long run. So, so that from that sense, it's like financially makes a lot of sense. I think in terms of regular testing, like let's say going from just your normal yearly with your doctor, which doesn't have that many markers to adding like a quarterly home test, like what we sell, I think that's a, it's it, it, we try to make it as as inexpensive as possible, but it's still, you know, it's an out of pocket expense. I think if you're already doing the really basic stuff, like you're exercising and sleeping normally and so on, then it makes sense to layer that on to get like additional benefits. I think doing a single test for screening is really valuable no matter what. Uh, but doing regular testing is probably uh, I would only add that after the after the really like diet sleep and exercise if you're not doing those i mean the test might motivate you to do them right so mm -hmm. then i would say it's like a cost of getting the sleep and exercise and so on because you might need to see that like improvement or those problems to to like want to to want to do all that yeah some people are definitely more quantifiable qu quantifiably driven right they need to see the numbers you know have that gamification go do i hold the line you know do i need to drop some things improve some things and sometimes unless you're very brutally honest or have great uh, personal biofeedback or can kind of do that body check, which a lot of people takes many weeks, months, years to even get to that point until you get a number, you're really kind of just throwing darts on the wall. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So I think, I think it's, that's kind of how I see it. But, uh, for me, it definitely helps to have the numbers because I, uh, yeah, I like, I like the, that it's more objective. So like when I'm negotiating with myself about, uh, how I, how I should live, it, it, it definitely helps me uh, you know, put more, put more of my energy into, into health to then see the numbers come back. And, uh, uh, and I, I think that's true for a lot of people, right? It's kind of like buying a scale is a weight loss tool, you know, like it's, it's really your diet or whatever exercise that makes you lose weight, but it's the scale is like a big part of it, you know, <laughs> because if you're not measuring, it's easy. The to scale like, is the, the truth, truth teller. teller. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's, it's easy to fool yourself or whatever, ignore it if, uh, if you're not getting the numbers. So I think from that perspective, for a lot of people, it's, it's kind of part of that whole, of the whole equation. Um, I think also increasingly like uh, getting your hormones measured is valuable just because even if you live a decent lifestyle, like you could have exposures that screw up your hormones, like really lower your testosterone or other things. And and that can be, there's also people, people like this is more rare, but people also develop like um, I just, this a personal story, but you know, I know somebody that just discovered this and you know, she, uh, she had like an adenoma. So she was producing a huge amount of cortisol uh, or sorry, not, I think it was, it led to a lot, a lot of, it was prolactin. She was producing like a ton of prolactin and uh, that caused like all kinds of health problems that were like, went undiagnosed for years. Like she would go to doctors and say, why do I feel like this? And, and so eventually she got tested and it's like, okay, you have extremely high prolactin. So basically just getting your hormones measured at least once or twice to make sure that they're in reasonable ranges. It's a lot cheaper than, you know, self-medicating with, you know, let's say being depressed and having to take, you know, smoke weed every day, because it could just be, you know, that like you're, I, I don't know, it, there are many ways this can happen, but, you know, you can be exposed to a lot of plastics and have very low testosterone. Like that's a simple thing that can happen. And so at least if you have the number, you can start like figuring out, okay, what's going on because it's not always obvious. Uh, so, so I think there, there are many uh, kind of, because blood testing covers so many different things, like there are many individual reasons why it, it ends up being valuable to people. Uh, but that's like another example that's not related. You know, it's not diet or exercise. It can be other things. So. so knowledge is power. And speaking of, now we're in our homes. We want to run this at-home lab test. I know that you guys, and I've run through this test, and I'm going to share, I'm going to share my results, actually. 
Interesting to me because I actually ran side-by-side tests. I ran the exact same day, same morning. I did my at-home test with Cyfox. And then about an hour-ish later, I went down the road to a typical lab draw, went to a clinic, had to get in the car, drive, pay parking, go up the stairwell, do the whole thing. Took about two hours out of my day. Cyfox I did in 10 minutes, maybe, unpackaging it, reading it, all the things. And uh, so I got some really cool side-by-side comparisons. The 17 biomarkers that you all put in there, why? What are these 17 or maybe kind of why? What was the process going through? Why are these so important for people uh, to be aware of? That's a great question. So, uh, I mean, at the part of it, we're a blood testing company. So our expertise is really in making sure people collect the sample correctly, get their results, you know, making it very smooth. The selection of the biomarkers was done in a, so so the first thing we did is, okay, we want to maximize the number of markers you get out of a single collection because the cost of the person, it's not just money, it's also effort, right? Like you have to, it's not people don't collect their sample for fun. It's the same as like, <laughs> maybe, some people. <laughs> maybe some people, maybe some people. Yeah. Uh, but basically um, at the beginning we consulted, you know, we have great advisors like clinical advisors and we talked to a lot of uh, researchers like, basically whoever would talk to us that that kind of had you know expertise um and we have a couple of people that remain on the team as advisors and and you know help us uh basically update what we're doing and improve the analysis and so on but essentially um we did some of it empirically so we started out with a different panel and we actually tested thousands of people and we found that some of these things first of all weren't coming up with interesting results so like most people were normal uh or they were, and again, that might be because in the general population, there's a lot of abnormal people, but they're not the kind of person who's like going out and getting a, a test for themselves. Right, right, right. yeah. So so we're like, okay, for the population that we're testing, these markers, like I, I think, you know, we don't, in the base panel, the standard panel, we don't do creatinine because just everybody was normal on creatinine, you know, pretty much. And it never changed. That's another thing. We, we really focus on things that A, are, you know, People do find something interesting, like it's important, something that you need to change or want to change or improve. And the other thing is actually something that can be changed, right? So it actually responds to lifestyle or supplements or diet or whatever, right? So so it's really optimizing for those things um, and then linking it to different systems in the body. So we try to cover cardiovascular, metabolic uh, so like how your body processes sugar, like insulin, HbA1c, the, those kinds of markers, cardiovascular, you know, including the APOs, the, the more advanced lipid markers, and then, you know, vitamins, minerals, as much as we can do in, in that panel. And then we have additional panels for more and then uh, hormones. Um, and so it's, it's trying to get like a balance so that basically you get a lot, you know, you do this one test and you, you get a pretty, pretty broad coverage. Uh, and it probably covers like you know, many different early stage stages of chronic diseases, like we'll find, you know, everything ranging from like your typical, you know, like, oh, you're at risk for heart disease to like hemochromatosis, where you get people walking around with like 10 or 20 times more iron in their blood than normal, um, which is like a, it's like, after it, you know, it's like this disease where you start getting symptoms, you kind of don't feel great. And then like 10 years later, it's like a really, really bad and you, you're super sick. And, and Imagine catching something 10 years early, yeah. 10 yeah, years, years early. early. That's incredible. incredible. Yeah. And it's just not tested, you know, like until you really have like extreme symptoms, they're not going to test you. Um, so that, that's another one that, because we test ferritin, that's another one that we find. And if you guys are watching the video, I'm going to actually share while you're continuing to talk there, Michael, excuse me, I'm just going to actually show I'm just going to scroll through so people can kind of get a feel for, you know, also the dashboard is just so incredible. I I found it so easily interpretatable, if that's a word, Um, you kind of, you can break it down to really, I think any person can understand, you know, through these categories, you know, like you were talking about inflammation. Um, We can kind of see my results there. We can see my metabolic fitness, which is of really most interest for me right now because genetically predisposed. I've got diabetics in my family. So this is really important information for me, one that I'm always monitoring. Um, You can look at balance, hormones, testosterone, cortisol, even cardiovascular health. So a lot of things that you're talking about, you know, you can kind of really see on the screen here. And um, which kind of brings me to my next question, interpretation, you know, getting all this information is great for some people that have the awareness and education or training or just familiarity with I, I know what this is. I know how to interpret it. 
I have enough understanding to kind of know how then to apply it into my life in terms of lifestyle, nutrition, sleep, training. Um, but for maybe the general consumer, is there such thing as too much information? Is this just going to bombard some people and go, I don't know what to do with this, so I'm not going to make any changes or I'm not going to get a follow-up test here? Yeah, I think what we do is we try to, first of all, make it easy to see what the ranges are and like where you are in the range. We also give you some context, like this is where you are relative to the other, you know, thousands and thousands of people that have taken this test with us, you know, the, the broadly, like, uh, in a population level, like where do you, what is your population size by chance? Do you know, uh, your, your, your comparison within ranges of other Cyfox testers? The ranges that we use are more based on the best published research and, you know, kind of like large population studies and where you're supposed to be, but we do allow yeah. you to compare yourself also to just Cyfox users. So we'll tell you like, this is where you are relative to Cyfox users, which is, you know, in the range of like 10,000 people. Okay. Really solid population size, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think it's a little bit more representative because again, it's like the people who are at least willing to like go out and get a test for themselves. Right. So it, it might be, you, you're going to get less people that are just like totally don't care about their health or whatever. Um, so, so because that's how American ranges are built, uh, typically like when you go get a lab, they'll just tell you like, okay, you're, you know, within the two standard deviations of, of the average. And, you know, even though like half of the population is obese and, and so on, but, uh, but so we, a, we try to make the ranges very interpretable and, you know, we, we use the best known ranges for actual health. You know, we try to say like, this is actually optimal, this is normal, and this is bad rather than just, okay, this is like what typical Americans are. Uh, and then we have a whole insights engine, which is personalized based on your results. And you can also connect your wearables. So you get the sleep data in there and the activity data and heart rate data. Yeah. I was going to have that pulled up as well. I, I think it's really cool. I actually went on and I connected my Apple Health from my Apple Watch and my iPhone as well as my Whoop. And uh, that information was, um, if you guys, again, are checking out the screen, you can check out uh, over here. I'm going to show you. So there's a breakdown of all my results in the main categories. But then down here, it links in my activity, my sleep, brings in all the wearable data. So it's beyond just what's going on internally. It actually kind of shows me what that translates as and what's what that kind of looks like. So I can get a fair representation of activity, sleep, healthy behaviors, lifestyle, and how that really shows up in my labs. Yeah. And I think over time, as you like, if you were taking these quarterly, you would see how your sleep and so on are affecting these markers and that's helpful i think because it's not always the same for each person and it also gives us more information to provide insights so we do kind of like insights and action items uh so the insights are more informational like here's something to help you interpret what you're seeing uh and then the and that's always comes with like a reference so if you want to read the science paper or you know wherever whatever the source is behind that you can also do that we all, we'll also provide you with action items, which are kind of like, here's some things you can try. Uh, and that might be a supplement. It might be seeing your doctor. It might be, it could, it's, you know, it really depends. It could be a suggestion for something in your diet. Um, so that we have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these that are built in combination with, you know, just best known research, our advisors, and also actually working with our users, right, over the last couple of years. Um, and they're all customized to the data that we collect both through questionnaires and also through the blood tests. So we kind of try to blend everything. And then there's a still human in the loop. So they're not just like a computer spitting it out. There's a human in the loop, a, a clinical team member that's actually looking at it. Um, so it's, it's, a uh, you know, we try to combine the best of like doing it, some automation and then actually having a human being review it because it's, it's still not there where like, you know, you just type this stuff into chat GPT and get like the best, it'll say something, you know, but it's yeah, not like, uh, yeah. it's still not, it's still not there. And uh, it's, it's very kind of, um, it gives you kind of like the average suggestion, not the best one. Uh, so we, we're still very much, you know, have human in the loop and, and doing like just hands-on trying to give people the best uh kind of like feedback and next steps that we can um and where we also have some like we try to make it easy for example if you have metabolic issues we'll suggest like you should wear a continuous glucose monitor for two weeks and see you know kind of how how what's your glucose response to different foods so this is not a profit center for us or something but we basically will help people get because sometimes it's difficult to get a cgm like you have to get a you, you have to get a um uh, a reference from a doctor to get it so yeah and i think 
however you get it, you know, if like if you're in the category of people, and we see that in your biomarkers, right? That can that can benefit from CGM. We'll help you get one. You can go to somebody else or whatever. But we try to make sure that it's like very fr low friction, uh, as low cost as we can make it. Even supplements, like we recommend supplements, and we partnered with a company that's like really focused on. They do a lot of supplements for the military and like Olympic athletes and so on. So we we're you know built a bunch of stacks with them that are based on our blood work. Can I ask, and if you can say, is it Fount by chance? It's Fount, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I know, know Andrew, Andrew and the team, team over there. there. I love Fount. I use FlyKit every time I fly. He was on the show a couple of years ago. Um, I have not had jet lag in th two, three years. Yeah, it's incredible. What, what they do in supplementation and AI integration uh, and also taking into account your lifestyle, your preferred diet, your circadian rhythm, incredible. So I love to hear you guys are working together. That's great. Yeah, so we I mean, we think of ourselves like we the data that we're generating can really help build up a stack of supplements. Uh, and obviously, we're not a supplement company, and and that's not where you know uh, we basically just want to make it as smooth and easy for the person to just take action, improve your biomarkers, test again, right? So we built these stacks with them, and and that's available through us also. But we just give you know you can go go anywhere to get your supplements, but we try to give actual personalized recommendations so that you're not just buying supplements because of an ad or because you read something somewhere or like a podcast, but it's, it's really, it's really based on your blood work. Uh, and that's going to have, you know, much more impact. Huge. Love it. Well, kind of getting towards the end here, Michael, um, where can we go next with this information? I know that CyFox and this at-home diagnostic lab test is just really part of the long-term plan to educate people to become more empowered for your health, your wellness, both health span and lifespan. What's on the horizon? What can people do with this information truly? And what else do you see coming down the line to further empower the consumer for their well being? Well, what we're working on is also more like verticalized health programs. So the first one we're doing is cardiometabolic, like really focused on heart health. Um, and so there we'll actually if the person needs it, we'll actually help them get medication and then manage it to the lowest dose. So basically like statins or azitimib or one of the other like lipid lowering medications. I mean, we'll always first recommend like do supplements and diet. And I mean, there's a bunch of things you can try, but if you're not getting your ApoB to where you want it to be, you probably need to be on a statin. And, you know, there are guidelines to this, like it's not something that we <clears throat> invented, but normally your doctor will put you on a statin and then they'll test you in a year, but that's a me. year. Yeah. Yeah. That's very typical. <sighs> uh, I mean, just, you know, they're like, whatever, it's safe. Just take it, see how it goes. But you, that means that they can't dose it to the lowest effective dose. They just give you like an average dose. That's very typical. And so something that we're working on and we have a beta program, you know, with about a hundred people, uh, is doing this lowest effective dose, frequent testing, like actually dialing it in, uh, which can really be better because, there are side effects of statins in some cases, like they can be worse or better and so on, but they're all- To most medications. Yeah, you, usually in my opinion, you're solving one problem, but creating another one, especially long-term. Yeah, so you wanna dial it down to the lowest effective dose and then monitor it, right? Maybe even get off of it at some point. Like if you're able to improve to the point where you don't need it, then you get off, right? And so that that's, uh, we're really excited about building programs like that. The one we're doing now is cardiometabolic and that'll become probably more generally available soon. Uh, and, and we built like a whole, you know, clinical team and system around this. And I think we'll probably go next to, uh, maybe, I mean, we're thinking about this, we'll see maybe testosterone optimization, um, mm -hmm. because that's it's so many tests come back low testosterone. It's just based on our users. Right. So we see a lot of high it would be low testosterone, not necessarily in the same test, but, um, and then, you know, maybe we'll look at others. I think we don't want to become one of these companies that just like sells all the things, you know, so like, oh, we sell erectile dysfunction pills and <laughs> hair loss. And oh, now we're like a weight loss company because of mm. Ozempic, you know, like that's a very typical path for like a venture funded company. So we're, we're, we're not like that. We're really looking at things where like, where can we make a difference with frequent blood testing? I think statins is one where it's obvious because mm -hmm. they're not, you know, this kind of feedback loop can get you to a lower dose. Um, and we're still looking around, like, what are the other areas where that, that can be like really impactful, um, and where, you know, telemedicine can work, right. Where you don't need necessarily like an in-person visit. Um, but that's, I think the future for sure is that you will have device in your home, like, you know, cartridge like this, this is like an, you know, we don't sell this yet. This is like an experimental home blood test cartridge. You can 
get basically get this delivered by DoorDash. Let's say you you're you know you have a this can even work for like more acute things, right? Like if you're sick, you get a cartridge delivered, you get diagnosed, you get medicine, you know, same day, right? So instead of waiting, let's say five days to know whether you have like a bacterial or viral infection, you could take a blood test, you find out it's bacterial, you get antibiotics, same day, everything from DoorDash, and you know, you feel better the next day. That's a kind of future that you can imagine if you have like a platform for blood testing in the home. And obviously, if you have, let's say, a thyroid condition, right, you can take the thyroid panel right away, you get your result in two hours, and your physician is updating your medication remotely, right? So it's, it's it can all be very smooth. Right now, you know, people that have to, they have to go to a lab, schedule, they miss their appointment, you know, it's, I used to think that I preferred venous draws to finger pricks, you know, but uh, I've first of all, gotten very used to doing the finger. So I think that's become less of like a barrier for me, actually, it's like zero, I do it like, but I've done, you know, 50 of these tests or something over the last couple of years. But uh, the last time I went to get a venous draw for something else, I don't know what's going on. I mean, it might be part of this issue of like, just generally, there are fewer people who want to work in these jobs. But I had uh, the first nurse like stab me, did not get blood. And I have veins, like you can see them, you know, no blood. Second one comes, stabs my other arm, no blood. And uh, oh, they're like, man. I don't know what to do. I was like, just like human pincushion. I'm done, you know, <laughs> Jeez. and it's so anyway i i think you know venus draws also i always forget you know until i go get one that it's like maybe it's gonna work maybe it's not you know it depends on the operator uh so it's it's uh that's another benefit that i i kind of uh often miss to highlight is that at least with a finger prick it's pretty deterministic you know it's not you're not having somebody like you really need a skilled person to get the blood out of the vein right and that's something which if you're lucky and you're going to a place with a great phlebotomist then it's fine but if you get unlucky, it's actually, it can be really not great. Um, yeah. so that, that's, that's something else that I think we add a lot of value that it's just as you know, from that perspective, it's, it's more, it's in your own hands, like you're doing it. And if you do a good job, it's going to be very smooth. Yeah, absolutely. Man. Well, you know, like I said, my audience has heard it from the intro and me talking about it on social media at this point. Uh, I really enjoyed my experience with SciFox uh, th that morning. I ran side-by-side -side tests with the at-home kit getting Venus draw. Uh, I loved the expanded biomarkers I got from you guys, as well as the accuracy in comparison to this other, you know, other telehealth company where it was like a hundred bucks and you go do the labs. So it was more time about the same price point, but I didn't get some of the labs that uh, you all offer that are very important to me, like tri triglycerides and cholesterol and um, things that I think matter for anybody, but especially in looking at things like cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke, the number one killer of America is CVD. So why aren't we getting that biomarker drawn? So I had a great experience. Thank you guys so much for partnering with us on this episode. And uh, everybody listening, watching, if you want to learn more about CyFox Health and running your own labs, we got a great deal for you. You can check it out, link it in the show notes and, uh, and take care of it. So I'm, I'm on board. I can't wait to do it again, probably in another 30 or 60 days. Um, it's super convenient, super easy. And I love the dashboard as well. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Michael ever forward. What do those two words mean to you? How would you say you live a life ever forward? That's a good question. I, I did have time to think about this because you mentioned it earlier. Yeah, I mean, I think the way I think about it, at least, is is uh, there's parts of society which are always improving. You know, like every every two years, you get a phone that's twice as good. Uh, and, you know, I think we just need to, more things should be that way. Uh, there are, like, more things should just get better all the time. Uh, and there are some areas where it's it's harder, right? It's harder to improve them. But I, I like to work on, on problems like that. So, it, it, it's definitely more headache, you know, than building software or electronics or whatever. But I, but it's, uh, I think it's, it's very rewarding to try to create continuous improvements in things like healthcare. Uh, and hopefully, you know, over the years, we'll be able to do that. I think we've, we've already gotten something done, but uh, hopefully it'll continue. Uh, and it'll just be a doubling, you know, like SciFox will just every two years improve the offering, uh, you know, by, by a couple of you know, like by a factor of two, at least. Uh, so that that's kind of uh, how I would interpret it, I guess. Never a right or a wrong answer. So thanks for that interpretation. Yeah. Um, again, everybody, if you want to learn more about Michael and what Cyfox is up to, check the video description box, the show notes. I have it all linked for you, as well as all these other articles and references I, I had at the beginning of the episode. So with that, I'll say ever forward, Michael, thank you so much.